Uh, good morning everybody. Um, so uh, this video uh, uh, will be about the reunification um, and the acceptance by the four powers of the reunification uh, that culminated, uh, that, was, uh, that happened in, in, in the year uh, 1990. Um, so it is actually the last lesson of depth study five, uh, usual routine. Um, you should have your mind map in front of you um, printed off, hopefully, so you can be making the notes as we go through the through the uh, video. And obviously you can pause uh, the video um, at whatever mo moment you uh, see best fit. OK, so let's move on. Um, reminder um, that uh, each lesson working our way through we're doing a different um, depth study and the focus of this particular depth study was um, of, of this particular um, sort of revision exercise was uh, depth study four uh, so I ask you just to think about the uh, uh, depth study four is obviously about West, about the creation of West Germany and the consolidation of West Germany uh, 1949 to 1960 uh, so the mind map I've chosen is the one on the basic law so again I know you're working from home at the moment um, and I know the we have the uncertainty um, over the summer but um, I think it'll do you no harm at all just to have a quick attempt at that um, so you could print that particular slide off from the PowerPoint and then just try to map around the edge um, the sort of key points, as you can see, there are 16 points there about the basic law, um, the constitution of the um, of the Federal Republic of West Germany. OK, so let's, let's move into um, uh, this final lesson of Depth 35. Um, just beginning with the final slides from the previous lesson, um, just to, uh, so you can get your mind back to where we were. Um, the economic integration um, that uh, happened on the 1st of July uh, 1990 so that was that sort of first stage uh, remember there was an, an election in East Germany on the 18th of March and then de Maizière the leader of East Germany and Chancellor Kohl of West Germany moved very very quickly after that because of the, um, the East German um, the, the coalition, the Alliance of Germany, the one the East German election, um, was very, was completely in favour of um, moving to reunification as quickly as possible. And the first step of Chancellor Kohl's 10-point plan was economic integration. So those are the key points. Let's have a quick look through them. So do you remember the... Um, very reasonable rate in a one-to-one -one exchange rate um, in terms of sort of fluid money money um, in, in people's wages east germans wages although less favorable um, for um, other large amounts such as um, mortgages and we then looked at the impact and of course with hindsight although there's a great deal of enthusiasm um, it appears that the economic reunification um, that took place in July in July 1990 was um, not thought through properly by the um, economists at the time. Uh, it, it was heavily flawed, um, and it did result in a, basically a complete meltdown of the GDR economy with a long-term impact um, that sort of disincentivized. Um, investment in the eastern part of Germany so once the full reunification took place in the October of 1990 um, and even up to this present day um, the unified Germany is still feeling the impact of that okay so that's, that's as far as we got from the last lesson um, <clears throat> Here's a, a quick knowledge retrieval for you. Again, you can just pause the video and quickly jot down the nine answers to those questions. I won't bother reading them to you, but uh, uh, they follow the usual format from last lesson. 
from last month and then deeper knowledge. We'll move on now to the next slide which gives you the answers so you can <coughs> self-test. Okay. Um, moving on. There's the flipped learning for today's lesson. Um, preparation. Those are the key sort of areas that we intend to cover. The usual slide. Um, as you can see there, uh, this is the last lesson of the six lessons that we've been, the six hours that we've been working on this particular um, fifth depth study. Uh, and as you can see there, <coughs> the um, remaining three lessons um, will complete section C. We've obviously already brought um, breadth study economy all the way up to 1990, but we need to bring breadth study society up to 1990. So we'll do three lessons focusing on the key sort of issues there. More on that at the end of this video. And there's our mind map for today's um, lesson. Okay, so uh, the four power meeting is the first strand. Uh, and then we'll move into coal overcoming doubts. Then the two plus four negotiations. <coughs> um, and then the reunification that happened um, in October 1990 and its aftermath. Um, so pushing on usual format then okay so I'll, I'll i've written an, in a nutshell a summary of the key points for that strand and then sitting beneath that is the detail which is pretty much taken from the textbook uh, so uh, in a nutshell cole's proposal uh, for a reunified germany um, remember that was originally outlined in his 10 point plan he published in December um, 1989, immediately after the fall of the Berlin Wall. So Kohl's proposal um, for reunified Germany was greeted with huge popular support at the grassroots level. In other words, ordinary Germans in both West and East Germany, as well as the leaders of these two German states. Okay. So in a sense, what you've got to try to imagine there is a sort of social pyramid. And you've got the social pyramid of East Germany. And you've got the social pyramid of West Germany. So you've got the GDR and the um, FRG. Okay. And what we're saying is that, and it's, it's a useful way of looking at this because... Um, you can apply, certainly apply this approach when you're writing your essays in the exam that the bottom level of society, the ordinary people, okay, um, in, in particular the sort of like working classes, but also to a large extent the middle classes of the two countries, okay, they were applying the pressure, okay, they favoured reunification. So that's what we mean by grassroots, okay? The support for reunification came from below. It came from millions of people. And at the top of the pyramid, you've got the leaders. You've got de Maizière in East Germany, and you've got Chancellor Kohl in West Germany. And they feel, they sense that support, okay? Now, as you know, Chancellor Kohl in West Germany, it took a while for him to come round to reunification. Remember how he was completely stopped, shocked and, and stunned when he visited East Germany um, uh, in the autumn of 1989. And, and that changed his mindset. He, he realised that uh, his, proposal for, his, his proposal to bring about a reunification could um, happen much quicker um, than... than than, than he originally thought. De Maizière in East, in East Germany, of course, was elected into power on the back of the voters, um, the people at the, at the grassroots level in East Germany. So uh, it was his effect, effectively his ticket, his, his uh, electoral promise um, was to reunify Germany. 
So what you basically got is you've got pressure from below at the grassroots level, popular pressure, but also you've got, certainly in the two countries, you've got support from above. Okay, and that's I think of an important an important way to approach this question in the exam um, when you're talking about causation. Um, one of the big factors, one of the big areas, is how much of what caused the reunification, um, how much of it was from below or from above, and it was obviously a combination of the two and how they work together. So that that's really what we're sort of talking about there. Okay, so. Um, However, the two Germanys, remember, were still subject to the four power agreement made at the Potsdam, um, the Potsdam Agreement um, of July 1945 at the end of World War II. And of course, as you know, the four power agreement said that um, effectively no decision was to be made about the future of Germany unless there was um, agreement by the four winning powers um, of, of, of the of the war, which of course were the USA, the Soviet Union, Britain and France. So no decision for unification could, sorry, misspelled nit be, made without the unanimous agreement of the four powers. Okay, so the four powers, therefore, with this pressure and this support, pressure from below, but support from above in the two countries, um, the four powers met in December 1989 to discuss Cole's 10-point plan. But they didn't invite Chancellor Cole. This was a meeting of, this was effectively a, 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 a sort of, effectively a form of summit meeting of the winners of World War II. Germany was still subject to the occupation statute, the, the terms at the end of the war. Um, and each of the four powers, for different reasons, rejected the proposal for reunification that's what we need to look at now so clearly there was a sticking point okay there was a great there was a huge popular support within the two germanys and there was support by the leaders of the two germanys but there was clearly um, a major sticking point so really at that particular stage at the end of 1989 in spite of the fall of the berlin wall etc etc um the prospects for a reunified Germany seemed to be very slim. Um, seemed to be very slim indeed. Now remember, at this particular point in time, this is December 1989. So this is before um, the events that we've spoke about in the last lesson. So De Maizière, um, uh hasn't um, been elected as leader of East Germany just yet. So sorry, that was a little bit misleading there. Um, at that particular point, it was Modrov who was the leader of East Germany. And that, of course, changed the situation from above in March 1990, three months later. Um, so that's the sort of like, be aware of that sort of shift that started to happen in the months after uh, the, the first meeting of the four powers. <coughs> OK, so <coughs> um, we'll move on then to the deep sits beneath it. OK, so uh, again, I don't really need to go through all of the points but uh, you can just pick those out um, and we'll develop some of them uh, so the purpose of the meeting we've covered that's the popular support by the ordinary people we've covered that but um, the four power agreement which in particular applied of course to Berlin um, the 11th of December um, meeting then that's where the four powers met it was basically the allied control council go way way back to depth study four that's what we're talking about so they they met in the hq of the old allied control council chancellor cole was very anxious um and there's a picture there of a, of chancellor cole um on that date meeting um, so not Chancellor Cole, there's, um, th there's a picture there of um, Gorbachev meeting with um, President Bush um, on the day the talk started and of course Chancellor Cole was excluded from that meeting, he wasn't allowed to go to that particular meeting. Um, so Cole was anxious, he interpreted this as a sign that the four powers believed they could discuss the future of Germany without consulting um, West Germany. 
and in the meeting, the four powers raised various concerns, which caused tensions to rise between Germany, or between West Germany and the four powers. But also, um, the, the popular mood in East Germany at this particular time was very much in support of reunification as, as well. Now, the main um, problem from the US point of view, and there's our US president, uh, notice it's George H. W. Bush, not George W. Bush. His son later became president at a later stage. But this is the president, 1893. It's George W. Bush's dad. Um, and um, the major sticking point he had was this. OK, so let's just um, unpick the, the key points. The US president in particular saw West Germany's membership of NATO as important at the 11th of December meeting. Um, he stated that the USA would not accept a unified Germany if it was outside of NATO. Um, so, of course, um, as you know, um, and it says there, West Germany had been admitted into NATO on the 6th of May 1955. Okay, so uh, you can sort of see on the map there, there's the picture West Germany in blue as a member of NATO. Um, and that, that's a, that situation had been in existence since 1955. But Bush was concerned that if Germany was reunified, West and East Germany came together, that the new Germany may decide not to be in NATO. Okay, which effectively if the new Germany were not in NATO, then effectively the front line in the Cold War would be pushed um, further uh, to the West. OK, so at the moment with West Germany and NATO, uh, there's the front line in the Cold War. However, if a newly unified Germany were to pull out of NATO, then effectively the front line in the Cold War would be further west. And that was really um, uh, Bush's main concern, the sticking point. On the other hand, the agreement of the Soviet Union was also needed for re reunification. And it was very doubtful that the Soviet Union would accept a unified Germany that was a NATO member. Because again, if we go back to our map there, if a if a Re, if a reunified Germany, represented by the circle there, were to be part of NATO, then the front line in the Cold War would effectively be there. Okay, it would move further to the east, which would be threatening to the Soviet Union. So there was our sort of Cold War uh, sticking point that uh, is important. So. Clearly, Gorbachev wasn't going to be happy if a unified Germany wasn't a NATO member. So, the USA um, doesn't want a united Germany to be part of uh, does want a united Germany to be part of NATO. The Soviet Union doesn't. Uh, in addition, Gorbachev was anxious that a reformed SED um, might be able to save the GDR as an independent state. So, remember at this particular time. Um, the SED is in that moment of transition, okay, following the fall of the Berlin Wall. Um, the SED has become, remember, the PDS, the Party of Democratic Socialism. Um, and Gorbachev, the leader of the Soviet Union, was clearly worried about this shift in the leadership of East Germany. Um, uh, um, and it because it's clearly a, a massive sea change. But it also was hopeful in many ways, because the old SED had basically been stagnant and corrupt and hadn't really been able to initiate change. Now that you've got a reformed SED, then it's possible that all these economic problems that, uh, uh, um, that, that have, have crippled East Germany for so many years and have prevented its growth and further development, well, maybe the PDS can resolve those issues. Maybe the GDR, East Germany, 
can be saved. Maybe there's no need for a reunification. Okay, so that was Gorbachev's stance at that particular point that uh, there was no need. Yeah, you know, that that let's wait and see. We've got a, a change of leadership in the in, in East Germany, so maybe um, there won't be a need for a reunification. Maybe East Germany can be saved by this newly reformed SED, which is the key point there. So that's USA and the Soviet Union. What about Britain? Um, and the leader of Britain was Margaret Thatcher, and France, and the leader of France was Francois Mitterrand. Now, both the British and French were angry that Cole hadn't actually bothered to speak to them before announcing his 10-point plan. So their motivations were sort of quite personal. They had, fe they had felt excluded by Cole. Um, Britain and France were especially concerned that a unified Germany would be a dominant economic power that would challenge the status quo in Europe. Okay, so that sort of concept of a, of a large Germany coming together would presumably, you know, if, if what Cole wants, the reason he wants it to happen is to to strengthen the economy of the of the two countries, um, and a, a, a single unified Germany would be potentially of a powerful economic block and it would basically therefore be a threat to the rest of Europe. Um, so Thatcher and Mitterrand basically took the, the, the line we don't want to reunify Germany what we will do is we will offer Western economic aid to the collapsing East Germany to bail East Germany out. Um, France and Britain were also concerned that Cole's 10-point plan made no reference to Germany's eastern border. Um, so if you were to have a reunified Germany, what would the borders actually look like? And in particular, um, to the border on the east. And when they challenged Cole about this, Cole dodged the question. And that made Thatcher and Mitterrand suspicious. And in a sense, they were backward looking. They were still, in a sense, trapped in the past, um, thinking about World War Two. And the last time there was a strong, dominant Germany in the centre of Europe, of course, it was led by Hitler. And they didn't trust Kohl. OK, they, they, they suspected that Kohl's intentions were... Um, although clearly he was not another Adolf Hitler, but clearly it raised those fears about a, a strong Germany in the centre of Europe, such as it happened in the 1930s 19, and the early 40s, um, that was looking eastwards, looking to... What, what about... Is, yeah, they're asking themselves, is Cole looking to recover territory that was taken away from Germany at the end of World War II? OK, so they didn't fully trust Cole. And on the back of that, um, other countries like Holland and Poland, and they, yeah, they had been occupied by Germany during World War Two, and also Italy. And I know Italy was on Germany's side at the beginning of World War Two, but remember Mussolini was deposed, and um, Italy um, had a change of leadership in 1943. But at this stage, now sort of. More than 40 years later, the leaders of those countries suddenly started thinking about, well, what about World War Two? Germany occupied us, and now suddenly we've, we've got a strong Germany in the middle of Europe that could be a threat to us. Okay, So they sort of came in on the back of um, Britain and France in raising objections. Okay, so there's our first strand. So... Didn't really look great to the largest, you know, to, to some extent. You've got a, a, a clear proposal by Cole presented at the end of 1989 after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Um, you got popular support in both East Germany and West Germany, and you've got the four powers hesitating, and really the decision lies with them. So they are a sticking point. So our next one the heading Cole overcame the doubts. How did he manage to do that? OK, so again, let's just go into the detail on this. OK, so in a nutshell. In January, February and early March of 1990, Cole 
of West Germany, the Chancellor, worked with considerable political skill, and I think that's something that you need to be emphasising. Um, again, you, you take your particular angle in essays. You, you say, what are the factors? Was it populist pressure from below? That's one factor. From above, you can talk about the political skills of leaders, and certainly Chancellor Cole came into his own here. Um, and basically his approach was to pick them off one by one, um, and he was a very sort of cunning negotiator. So he started with the US President George H.W. Bush. And the major point, as we said, the sticking point was about whether a, unif a future unified Germany should belong to NATO. And that's what the US wanted. So Cole conceded, he, he accepted Bush's point, okay? But he, he said, I want something in return. Um, you have got to give me full backing for reunification, okay? Um, and again, Cole was clear that if America came in and said, we back the reunification, then that would probably influence Thatcher and Mitterrand because Thatcher and Mitterrand were against reunification. So once America was on board, the Thatcher and Mitterrand, the leaders of the UK and France, were very quickly won over. Okay, So that was an astute move by um, Cole, working on the Americans first. Of course, what he's now stuck with is a big problem. Okay, He's agreed that Germany, a future United, United Germany, should belong to NATO, and the, the, the problem, of course, the sticking point that will now be will be good, will be the Soviet Union because they're going to be very anxious about that. But in a sense, Cole parked that to one side for the moment. Okay? He's taking it one step at a time. Now, those negotiations, as you see, didn't happen overnight. It took about two and a half months for those negotiations to take place. So while they were happening, of course... The events that we looked at in the last lesson were happening simultaneously. So there were the general elections in West Germany in December 1989, which Cole won. Okay. Um, and, and again, that was one of the reasons he did the 10-point plan, because he had an, as a politician, he had an eye on the vote, and he knew that the West German voters wanted a reunification. Okay. Um, but also then, of course, in March 1990, the 18th of March, which is what we talked about last lesson, there were elections also in East Germany, which resulted in the Alliance of Germany coalition winning that election and a new leadership led by de Maizière in East Germany, which we looked at last lesson. So what Cole has done is he he's superbly played his ace card. OK, Um which was that unless collective agreement was reached to support reunification, East Germany would inevitably collapse. And that's basically what he knows is his strongest point. OK, without reunification, East Germany will collapse. And if East Germany collapses, that, that will have a huge negative consequence for Europe. Um, and the wider world. It will plunge Europe into economic uncertainty, basically like a huge hole in the middle of Europe. Um, and so he's demonstrating here, look, there is huge popular support in the two Germanys, and now we've got two leaders in the two Germanys who want reunification, and I've got America on, on board as well. OK, uh, so he's, he's playing all of those features at the same time. But the sticking point, as we said, is the Soviet Union, OK? Because Gorbachev still needed to be won over. And the, the main sticking point with Gorbachev is fear of Germany, a future unified Germany belonging to NATO. And, of course, Kohl has promised that. OK, so the detail that sits beneath that, I'll just leave it for you to map that sort of information onto your mind map. OK, so there is a picture of Bush and Cole meeting in early 1990. So there's the agreement. Cole agreed with Bush's demands that uh, the future unified Germany would belong to NATO. He reasoned that a unified Germany outside of NATO could lead to NATO's collapse and Europe dominated by the UK and France. Um, he 
Cole understood that his strongest negotiation tool was the fact that in the meantime, what ticking away was the, a collapsing country. Okay. Uh, and Cole is predicting that if, if East Germany collapsed, that would lead to complete chaos for Europe and the wider world. So there needs to be a, a, a solution found quickly. So he's applying that pressure and he brought Bush around. The United States went around. Bush became a strong supporter. Bush believed that if he, he, if he did not support Cole, then West Germany might leave NATO. We covered that point. The SPD in West Germany, the, the main opposition party, led by Oscar Fontaine, and there is a picture of him there, was very critical of NATO. Okay, um, SPD, of course, if they were in power, they don't want to spend money on the military, they would rather spend money on welfare programmes for the working classes, etc. And Bush, President Bush of America, was very anxious um, that if Cole's political programme failed, then in the future general election in West Germany, the SPD might be elected into office. And of course, if Lafontaine um, was elected into office, then the fear is, is that... Um, Germany would be pulled, the West Germany would pull, pull out of NATO. So basically, push, Bush wants to keep coal in power. Okay. So all the, the, all the main features are therefore in place um, for, for a deal to be struck between coal and Bush. And there's a bit of information there about Lafontaine. He was the SPD's candidate for the Chancellor of Germany. Remember, there were elections in December 1919. And although he lost, he was able to lead the SPD to a net 46 seat gain. And that worried Bush. Okay, He wants to keep coal in power for the longer term. So to consolidate good relations between the USA and West Germany. And there's our friend Margaret Thatcher with... Um, President Mitterrand of France, they still did not support a reunification, but they were, however, aware that a collapse in GDR um, was making reunification increasingly inevitable. They were fighting against the tide, especially as America was come on board. So once America came on board, Britain and France increasingly started to fall into line and, and they were less vocal in in their objections although they were still very nervous about it so the soviet union and gorbachev as we said is concerned about the nato thing however remember the soviet union is economically crippled as well and they can no longer compete in the cold war goes back to those points from depth study um, uh, the, the the beginning of this step of this step study, um, and they they can't compete with um, the uh, Star Wars initiative in outer space and so on and so forth. They've had to pull effectively economic support out of Eastern Europe because they need to spend money on themselves, not on the the satellite states. So Gorbachev understood that at this stage. Only a massive loan could prop up the GDR, but he can't provide that loan. He was unwilling and economically unable to give any assistance to East Germany because the USSR had its own considerable economic problems. So as a result, in mid-February 1990, Cole went over to Moscow and visited Gorbachev. They had that face-to-face -face conversation to confront this, this issue. Um, and during that visit to Moscow in February 1990, the question of reunification was put on the table. And Cole said very clearly, look, that if we reunified, it will become a German issue, OK, that the economic fate of the two Germanys will become a German issue. You will be freed of that burden. We will sort it out ourselves. And Gorbachev, because in his head, he's thinking money. OK, I need to be able to spend money on my own country. And up until now, East Germany is a burden on his own country. He's been having to look after it to try to bail it out. 
and a clear guarantee was given on, on, in that meeting, you will be freed of that burden of East Germany. So that statement um, proved to be a critical b breakthrough, which opened the way for the two, for what would then become the two plus four negotiations, which we'll move on to next. Okay, so halfway through the strands. Now, we'll now move on then to the two plus four negotiations. So, again, in a nutshell, let's just uh, zoom in a little bit there. So, from March then, 1990, through to September 1990, um, the leaders of East and West Germany were Cole and de Maizière, were admitted to the four power meetings up until March. The four powers met and they did, they excluded the two the two German leaders. Okay, so effectively the four power meetings now became the um, two plus four meetings. That's why it was called that, and these meetings shifted to Moscow. Okay, so that it now became the two plus four meetings. So in these meetings. In particular, Cole became the key player. De Maizière took a back seat and agreed with everything Cole said, basically. So in these meetings, Cole, supported by America, Britain, France and East Germany, okay, De Maizière, were able collectively to overcome Gorbachev's concerns. It basically became five leaders talking at the one who Gorbachev, who still had doubts. Um, and... They were able to overcome those concerns in two ways. Firstly, in March 1990, at the, actually the 18th of March, which was just shortly after the 2 plus 4 power meeting started, there was a general election scheduled in East Germany. And we did that last lesson. So hopefully this is putting the time frame together for you. And... That meeting resulted for the first time ever in the appointment of an East German government led by de Maizière. So de Maizière is virtually his first brief. As the newly elected East German leader, he went straight over to Moscow and joined these meetings. Okay, Because the elections happened just at the time that these new, the, the, the new meeting was called. And... Because his his ticket in the elections was to support reunification. Obviously, when he arrived in Moscow, he gave full support to Cole's plan to move to full political reunification as soon as possible. Because, obviously, in the East German elections, that was his main ticket to get himself elected. So, as a result, Cole was able to emphasise that German reunification was a German matter. Okay, as we said on the previous side fully supported by the German people of both countries which will be handled by the German people themselves without the need for Soviet support so the argument here Cole subtly played on Gorbachev's main concern which was that the Soviet Union whose own economy was in a desperate situation could no longer afford to support ailing countries behind the Iron Curtain on the back of that Cole very cleverly secondly offered a huge West German loan to the Soviet Union, which kind of like sealed the deal, I suppose. Um, uh, if there was any doubts left in Gorbachev's mind, suddenly when Cole followed through and said, we will give you a huge loan to help you sort out your own problems, that effectively um, resolved any doubts in Gorbachev's mind. OK, so that's the, the, the main points there, uh, the, the two plus four meetings. So the details, again, you can work on noting those yourself. The picture there, um, we keep talking about the Alliance for Germany. That was the uh, coalition. Remember, de Maizière was the leader of the CDU in East Germany. Um, but he formed an alliance with a couple of other parties, the Democratic Awakening and the German Social Union. Thus, they were the Alliance for Germany. It won the most votes in the East German election, 48.2% of votes cast, and ended up controlling 192 of the 400 seats in the Volkskammer, the um, East German parliament. And de Maizière 
um, effectively became the minister president. So we did that in the previous lesson. Okay, so those election results considerably helped the two plus four negotiations because the GDR Parliament was now fully in favour of reunification. So as a result, the East German government now formally requested that East Germany be allowed to join West Germany under the terms of Article 23 of the Basic Law. And the Basic Law of West Germany that was drawn up in 1949, Article 23 stated that unification could take place if East Germany accepted that a reunified Germany would be under the laws and institutions of West Germany. So basically, de Maizière is now invoking the Article 23 of the West German Constitution to say, we want reunification and we accept in East Germany that when reunification happens, that East Germany will will fall subject to the basic law of West, West Germany. That basically a future reunified Germany will be West Germany expanding its basic law to encompass the East German people. Okay, so that, that of course all happened in March 1990. Um, and then... Very soon after that, after that, um, three months later, three and a half months later, of course, the economic unification, which we looked at in the last lesson, then happened with a great deal of enthusiasm. So it's all sort of coming together, hopefully. So the critical condition was our friend Gorbachev. Gorbachev was desperately needed help. He was asking for financial help from the USA. The USA rejected it. So Gorbachev turned to West Germany for financial help and that enabled coal to overcome that final sticking point. So the final sticking point had been overcome and that sticking point was a Germany as a member of NATO. And in May 1990, um, Gorbachev, the leader of the Soviet Union, told Bush that he would support a unified Germany that was a member of NATO. Okay, It was a risk. It obviously was a security risk to the Soviet Union, but Gorbachev, because of course um, NATO would its frontiers would move closer to the Soviet Union if a, a unified Germany would be part of NATO. But um, in terms of the economic state of his own nation, he believed that this was a risk he was he was prepared to take. Um, so in turn, this opened the way to further agreements between Gorbachev and Kohl, which paved the way for final reunification, which we'll move on to now. The final dot in the I's and crossing the T's really is what we're looking at here. OK, the way is now open um, to um, create um, a unified Germany. Quick, um, another one of these, just throwing them in. Uh, so you can pause the video and play those yourself and uh, test yourself out 11 questions answers are on the next screen there you go give yourself a mark out of 11. i know it's weird for the context of uh of you um because I remember I'm um, casual listeners of this video in the future. I'm actually recording this in the uh, March 2020 at the time when uh, the, the, the A-level summary exams have been cancelled. Um, but um, remember, keep focused on the fact that that uh, you could be sitting the exam uh, in the autumn of, 90, of, of 2020. Okay, so the final strand, reunification and its aftermath. Let's just pull it together then in terms of what actually happened. So, in a nutshell. So Gorbachev is now on board. Okay, that final obstacle has been overcome. Okay, so it's a question of moving rapidly now. And it happened literally in about six weeks. So on the 13th of September, the four powers signed the Treaty on the Final Settlement with respect to Germany. 
bizarrely, this was in effect the peace treaty that ended the Second World War with Germany. That had never happened because of the Cold War. Now it at long last has been able to happen. Okay, so the division of Germany in 1949, of course, removed any possibility of there being a peace treaty. Now that there's agreement about reunifying Germany, they can at long last agree a peace treaty. They can end World War II for good. Okay, so the way was now open for Cole and de Maizière. They'd already merged their countries economically. They can now make the necessary step towards full political reintegration. And that full political reintegration happened at midnight on the 2nd and 3rd of October 1990. Okay. On the same date as the merger, as the reunification, a general election was then held across the whole of both halves of Germany. Clearly there needs it to be, because you're creating a new country. So a general election was held in which, so up until that point, for example, there had been a West German CDU and an East German CDU, each in their own separate countries. The two CDUs merged to form a single party that campaigned in that election, and that happened with all the political parties. So the SPDs of the two separate countries merged and became a single SPD, and that general election was held um, on that particular date, um, the 2nd of October 1990, um, with the result announced on the 3rd of October 1990. So as a result, on the 3rd of October 1990, the general election, um, the, the resounding winner was the CDU. So Helmut Kohl um, was, um, it was appointed as the Chancellor of newly unified Germany. And you can imagine President Bush, huge sigh of relief from his point of view. The whole deal had been struck about a future unified Germany being part of NATO. Being part of NATO. Um, if La Fontaine had been elected, um, it could have been a different story. But the, 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 the grassroots support for reunification was so strong, in a sense, it was a given that Cole and the CDU were going to win the election. OK, obviously, de Maizière, um, he has merged his party with the West German CDU. So de Maizière no longer has a country to be the leader of. So he just stepped down. I'm not quite sure what happened to de Maizière, whether he became, I presume he became a key figure in Cole's government. Um, some of you to look up. So the newly elected Bundestag, remember, which is the, the, the old West German parliament, now became the parliament for the whole of Germany. Because remember, the basic law, Article 23, simply said that um, West Germany would expand its remit so all the the old institutions of West Germany would now apply to the whole of East Germany, the, the, to, to East Germany as well, in, in, a, in a unified Germany. Um, so the, the newly elected Bundestag now represented all Germans, not just West Germans. Um, the capital no longer needs to be Bonn, so it returned to Berlin. And Berlin joined the new Germany as a new federal state. Remember that because of the uh, special status of Berlin um, throughout the Cold War era, uh, still subject to the occupation statute and to the um, Potsdam Agreement, Berlin had never been able to be, even though West Berlin was in effect really part of West Germany, um, remember that uh, West Berlin was not officially part of West Germany. Um, uh, remember the fact that the uh, um, Berlin could only sit in the Bundestag as observers. Uh, but now Berlin is a fully constituted federal state, part of the new Germany. So that's the point that's being made there. Okay. So the detail that sits beneath it. Uh, there's the headline from the New York Times. Two Germanys unite after 45 years with jubilation and a vow of peace. OK, so again, you can sort of see the detail there. You can't quite see the print enough to read, unfortunately. Um, so the, 
put the, the, the points that we made. Let's just make, have a quick look at them. So the 2 plus 4 talks that had started in March 1990 effectively concluded on the 12th of September, and which was the day before the famous treaty that ended effectively ended World War II. Um, so the foreign ministers of the four powers, Britain, France, America and the USA, plus the foreign ministers of West Germany and um, East Germany, de Maizière himself signed it. Um, so six signatures went on to that treaty. And in that treaty, the leaders of the three countries agreed arrangements for the withdrawal of Soviet troops from uh, Germany um, for the eastern border of the new Germany and the size of the new German army. There was a last minute sticking point, almost out of spite. Um, Thatcher jumped in um, and raised a few objections. Gorbachev was a little bit awkward at the end. Um, concerns about Western military activities, but that was very quickly overcome. And at midnight on the 2nd and 3rd of October 1990, um, the territory of East Germany became part of the Federal Republic of Germany. So the, the, the Federal Republic of Germany, which up to that point had only represented West Germans, now became a sovereign state that represented all Germans. And the aftermath. Okay, nice little map there. Um, if you look at, uh, as you can see, Berlin has become a new state. Okay, so uh, Berlin there is now added as a new state. They did um, uh, slightly change the number of states. They merged some, etc., etc., as part of the reunification. Uh, so let's have a look at what happened. So Berlin was restored as the capital city. Berlin became a new federal state. Um, the 144 representatives of East Germany simply then joined the enlarged Bundestag. Okay. Um, there were new federal elections in December. Remember, so uh, the elections of the 2nd and 3rd of December were the national elections, but there were separate state elections. Um, ten days later, on the 14th of October, f the five East German federal states, Mecklenburg, West Pomerania, Brandenburg, Saxony, Anhalt, Saxony and Thuringia, then had their elections. The CDU won the four of the five state elections. Brandenburg was won by the SPD, that was the one exception. And then in the federal elections of 2nd of December, um, the CDU and its Bavarian ally, the CSU, won 44% of the vote, um, as opposed to the SPD, which won only um, 33. Apologies, that should say the national elections, not the federal elections there. Okay. As an exception for these elections, only the 5% rule was applied separately to the old and the new federal states. Um, so that, that exception, the 5% rule, um, um, was applied separately to the old and the new federal states, which meant that the PDS did win some seats. Um, remember the old 5% rule that capped um, the... Uh, uh, ensured that the extremist party um, could not actually win. Um, Helmut Kohl had a commanding majority in the first parliament of the newly united Germany, which is the sort of um, key point there. Okay, so um, that's it, okay, in terms of the aftermath. Um, just a reminder, um, the, su the, the supplementary reading, just to consolidate your understanding, make sure you're very secure in your knowledge and understanding the detail in the textbook. Isn't that great? Um, Turner is excellent. Read Turner. Carr is also good. And you've got those um, Osmond and um, Kitson, the two textbook, the, the two other. Um, Kit Kitson is another A-level textbook, but Turner is by far the best book. To, so just take the time to read through um, Turner's explanation of this. Okay, and so the mind map fully 
with, with the uh, in a nutshell uh, mapped out for you. So we've now got three more lessons left to cover. Okay. Um, so uh, the finishing off society, three more lessons. Um, we'll use these next three lessons. Um, and I'm going to upload these because seeing as we're in self-isolation during the Easter break. I don't want to really hold people back. It's up to you, really, if you want to basically work on them over the Easter holidays or not. Um, no, normally, I'd say you need a break, um, a little bit of a break. You've got the summer exams coming up. Obviously, it's all changed for you. My gut feeling is let's just keep the momentum moving. Let's just cover the specification, get to the end. Uh, so I won't pause. I will produce three more lessons. I'll upload the materials to Padlet. I'll do three more YouTube commentaries just to sort of like bring closure to the specification. Um, so you can see the sort of reading for that, but I'll talk you through all of that. So watch your emails. Um, don't assume that nothing's going to happen now until uh, until term five. I, I do intend to upload the materials to Padlet and to do three more YouTube videos for this. Okay. Uh, finally, a reminder, we've now finished Depth 35, so consolidate. Look at those questions um, that uh, I've listed for you. Um, work your way through the modelled answers on the rev in the revision guides in the textbook, and in particular, um, looking at the indicative content of the mark schemes and the chief examiner reports where they model actual answers. Um, remember... Um, uh, there was a question, so has this been examined in the past? In 2018, the 2018 paper, there was a section B question, how significant was the role of Helmut Kohl in the reunification of Germany? So that's a good one for you to look at. So go to the Mark Scheme indicative content, there'll be some good points there, but also go to the Chief Examiner's Report where there is a scanned answer from a live question. Um, to that particular question okay but elsewhere as you can see you've got lots of information in the revision guides and the textbook including modeled answers um, to look at um, and in particular there um, uh, at the top the very the very first one there um, a model answer from the textbook. There's an average answer on page 180, 181, and a strong answer on pages 182 to 3. Um, there's also a model answer in the revision guide to a section A question, a source question. Um, assess the value of the source for revealing Helmut Kohl's and the US President George Bush's attitude to G German unification and the approaches of the two men to the process of bringing about unification. Um, so um, that's a section A question that's modelled for you uh, in the um, revision guide by Alan Farmer. Um, plus, as I say, um, on the specimen paper, uh, there's a question. So in the specimen paper, go to the indicative content in the mark scheme for that particular one and lots of other ones in the revision guide. So lots for you to work through there and to have a look at. This is just a quick summary, just in a different format of the uh, of the questions there for consolidation. That's it. Sign off now. Hopefully that was useful to you. Thank you very much. Bye.